All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to another episode of Fresh Finds. I'm sitting here in my new workshop uh, in our, our new house on Long Island, uh, Port Jefferson, New York, to be specific. Last time I checked in with you with the Fresh Finds, uh, we had just moved into this house and the, air, the whole area down here was in disarray, didn't have much to show you. Today, I'm very excited to give you a tour of the new workshop space, which I'm gonna show you here in a little bit. But I also wanna show you some new clubs that I've picked up as this is a Fresh Finds episode. So to kind of bring you up to speed on what I've been up to over the last month, uh, this is pretty much it, <laughs> you know, working on this space and then obviously a ton of projects in the rest of the house. The other side of the basement, which will end up being the museum space, is also going to be sort of a living room space. So uh, we've decided to modernize it a little bit. We're going to put some new uh, laminate um, vinyl floor down and also where we're going to paint the walls and uh, kind of spruce some things up. So probably in the next month or two, I'll get that project finished and then I'll be able to shoot some videos from that side. I have some fun future plans for Hickory Hacker and uh, they involve different spaces that I'm going to have over here, like a podcast space and things like that. Uh, the other thing that I've been up to is catching COVID from a Mets game. So uh, if you've ordered some clubs from me in the last two, three weeks, I apologize for the delay on that. I, I basically was out of the workshop for about a week dealing with a mild case, but uh, I'm feeling a lot better now and getting over that. Um, so there's that. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the other bit of news, and while I was actually rehabilitating upstairs in my sick room, I had some time to work on my website. I've been talking about my website for, oh, probably almost a year now, and I'm um, wanting to have a nice, easy way for people to see what I have in my collection um, and also order clubs from me. So um, basically what I've done, what I've decided to do is instead of waiting for everything to be 100% how I want it, I'm going to launch the website with what I think is the essentials. So you're going to see very, you know, it, it's going to be a fairly bare bones website to start. There's some things there for you to check out um, for sure at hickoryhacker.com. Um, but the big thing with it is going to be the store gallery function. And uh, basically the, the way this will work is if, um, you know, I get a club that I want to sell, I'm going to post photos and information of it on my Instagram page. So if you're not following my Instagram account, definitely do that. It's just Hickory Hacker. Um, but the, anytime I have something I'm going to sell, I'm going to post it on Instagram with a link that goes to the website. And then you're going to go to the website. You'll see more information, more photos of the club for sale. And then instead of there being a shopping cart for you just to throw the club in and order it, um, I have a, a contact button. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, Squarespace, while it's a great website and, and very intuitive for building a website, uh, I haven't quite found a functionality behind the scenes that allows me to customize the shipping quotes. Um, so that, that's the problem is some, you know, every club has a different weight, different length sometimes. Um, so the way I'm going to have to do that is have you reach out to me with your interest in that club and then I'll reach out to you and give you a, a specific or exact shipping quote for where you're at for that particular club. Uh, the website's also going to allow you to peruse my collection as I have time to add things to it because my idea here is to build a resource for folks and um, when you're searching for clubs online or information about clubs that you come across, it's possible that I might have come across that club as well and I might have more information about it. So as time permits, I'm going to add more photos to the gallery. So it's basically going to be a combination of clubs that are for sale, clubs that have sold, and clubs that aren't for sale that are just part of my collection to use as a resource. Um, so, you know, anyway, the, 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 the good news is that the website is up and running. So go to hickoryhacker.com. Uh, you can check that out today. Um, but the, uh, going forward, definitely keep coming back and checking in on it because I'll be adding more to it as I have time. All right. So with that out of the way, let's get into some of the new club cubs, clubs that I've acquired. Um, Long Island's been great for estate sales so far with Hickory clubs. Uh, this is kind of a similar setup as what it was when I was in the Kansas city area, uh, more than two years ago. Uh, where I seemed to be the only person that was looking for hickory golf clubs. And I've actually run into several Facebook marketplace listings. And then, uh, as I'm going to show you here in a second, some estate sales, uh, where I seem to be the only person really bidding on this stuff or asking about it. So that's cool. 
in classic fashion, I'm sure I'm going to create more competition for myself by doing this video, but that's okay. Um, but I've been, you know, pretty, pretty fortunate within the last month of, of finding some cool clubs. And, and uh, I've got plenty actually to show you in the next few episodes of Fresh Finds, but today I'll just focus on this first batch of clubs that I picked up in an, on, in an estate sale. Um, so if you're not familiar with AuctionNinja.com, it's a pretty good uh, site to use that, that basically collects all the different estate sales that are going on online. And it's regional though. So uh, up in the Northeast, you know, I see listings a lot of times for Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, um, Connecticut, and then there's a big leap and there's a lot of listings for Colorado. So if you're in either of those two areas and you're looking for hickory golf clubs, make sure you keep tabs on auctionninja.com. That's where I found the listing for this bag of clubs. So we've got probably a 1930, late 30s, early 40s era uh, bag here in very good shape. Um, that'll be part of a hickory you know, beginner set at some point. We've got three woods that are all early steel shaft. So at some point those might be collectible, um, certainly playable right now. But the real, uh, you know, the best part of this lot were the five Hickory Golf Clubs that were uh, pictured. And I could see that one of them was a flanged club. I'm always on the lookout for those because those are desirable both for collectors and players. Um, but this particular one really caught my eye because when you're looking for bells and whistles on a Hickory Golf Club, I think you're going to be hard pressed to, to beat this one because if I was to describe everything on this club in one big title, it'd be a mouthful. We'll, we'll try. All right, so what we have here is a, a Gibson flanged deep face mashy with a Maxwell hosel and a Cosby grip and braided whipping. So like I said, that's a mouthful. Let's break that down. Well, first of all, deep face mashy, so it's got a deeper face to it. This particular one is 34 degrees. So that's, that's really ideal for kind of a workhorse mashy in your set. And what's great about deep faces is that it helps you get through, it helps you get contact on balls that are in deeper rough. And with 34 degrees, you're still gonna get some distance. The flange here adds weight you know, and also helps you glide ac across softer turf surfaces. The reason that they were able to get this flange here is because they removed the weight from here. So that's what the Maxwell hosel refers to. These perforations ar around the hosel here removed weight from here so that it could be applied up here. So it's basically just a weight shift. Uh, and then we get into the Cosby part. So Cosby refers to Edwin Cosby. Um, in about 1925, he patented a form of, of whipping. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the patent referred to, but so what I'll describe is basically what Edwin Cosby clubs have in common. Uh, what they have in common is a long stretch of braided whipping um, and also usually this interesting grip. There's a grip called the Bussy Grip, which was, um, I believe it's George Bussy. Uh, it might be Boosie, I'm not sure how to pronounce that exactly, but uh, he was kind of famous for coming up with a grip that was, that was um, a, leather two, uh, a leather piece that was uh, stitched in the back. And so this particular club also features that grip. I'm not sure what the relation might be to the Bussy here, um, but Cosby clubs often have this grip if they're original to their, you know, if they're original. Uh, this is the in most interesting part of a Cosby club, in my opinion, is this very intricate braided whipping. It, um, it seems like overkill, I'll be honest. Um, I think that, you know, at this point in the Hickory era, there are probably people trying to come up with innovations to differentiate clubs for themselves that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, may not have been as necessary, um, I don't know. There might be somebody out there who can speak more to what the purpose of this long stretch of whipping would have been. Uh, traditionally, whipping was used to kind of reinforce uh, a crack or stiffen up an area of the shaft. And if that was the case in this instance, I could, it would make sense because as, as this is a deep face mashy, 
you'd be using this club in situations where you might have some rough to get through and um, you might benefit from having a more stout section of shaft here that doesn't flex as much and this would certainly make this whole area of the shaft stiffer. Uh, the other interesting thing about this club and other Cosby clubs for that matter is that the shaft is usually a combination of bamboo and hickory. If you take the butt end, oh, the cap already fell off somewhere, but um, I'll show you a close-up of this. But you can see the perimeter of the club is bamboo and the core of it is hickory. There are other Cosby clubs that I've come across where there's actually even a core of steel that goes down the center. And if I understand correctly, those clubs, even though they predate 1935, are technically illegal for a, a Society of Hickory Golfer competition because of that steel core. I've actually run into players who have been told that their, their entire set is non-conforming to Hickory Golf or SOHG Hickory Golf standards because of that steel core. Uh, in this particular instance, I'm not seeing a steel core. I'm just seeing the paneled kind of uh, perimeter of bamboo with the core of hickory. And um, yeah, like I said, bells and whistles, this club has them all. Uh, and it's also going to be a pretty good player. Uh, like I said, 34 degrees of loft and it's D7 swing weight. So it's right in my wheelhouse. And uh, the grip is a little thin for my taste, but I'm not going to take this off. I mean, this obviously this is a, a unique feature of this particular club and collectors would find this desirable as well. So I'm going to clean this up as best I can while maintaining its originality and then try it out at some point. So we got that one. These other ones are fairly uh, run-of-the-mill uh, hickories but um, cool nonetheless. We've got a Hendry and Bishop uh, niblick here. 46 degrees and C4. I think the player who used these clubs was probably a little shorter uh, because they're all basically cut down about, I don't know, three quarters of an inch from what their standard length would have been. Uh, and this club probably would have approached D0 if it was its original length. Oh, quick tip. If you're ever interested to know if a club's been cut down, you can usually tell by taking a look at the butt end and uh, this one has been worked a little bit, but often what you'll see is just a very clear rigid cut rather than a domed butt end. You can certainly tell the difference when you put them side by side, like which one has been cut and which one is still original. And you can see that this one has a pretty rigid uh, edge. So this, this shaft was cut, but then over the years, either at that time or maybe just by wear, there was a little bit more of a dome that kind of came back on this club. Uh, but just based on comparing, see if this one has it as well. Can't really tell because the grip's coming all the way to the end there. But um, anyway, just a quick tip. You, in, you know, once you get it on your workshop table and you measure it too, you'll figure out pretty quick whether it's too short for its loft. Uh, at some point, I'll do a video about this. I was actually having a really good conversation with Bob George Aid about this topic. And um, what, what we were talking about was clubs that people find on eBay uh, often don't have the specs listed. Uh, and certain sellers won't list the specs because they know that it will reveal that the club is too light for play. And it's easier, you know, I mean, it's kind of a... a, a you know, ethical vague area, I suppose. But uh, if you don't list the specs, then you can't say you didn't know it was going to be a good player. And, and that aside, and this is Bob's point, swing weight is not always a great indicator of whether or not a club's going to be a player. Uh, at a glance, for me, it's a good indicator of whether or not it's going to be something that I want to use personally, because I, I tend to like heavier clubs. Um, but the bottom line is you always have to pick up a hickory club yourself and figure out just by waggling it and then especially by playing it if it's going to be a club that works for you. And um, anyway, the, the end point of our conversation was Bob suggesting that somebody put together a chart at some point that kind of correlates the loft to ideal length of a club and then you can kind of you know determine swing weight uh, standards from that as well. And I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, the great club makers back at the turn of the century and earlier certainly understood 
the importance of swing weight, even if they didn't know all the, the intricacies like, you know, modern clubs uh, do now or, or modern club makers use now when they're making clubs. You know, they didn't talk back then about having a club that was D1. There was no, no swing weight chart like that. But they certainly were able to dial in by feel what seemed to be the ideal uh, weight. And, you know, I don't want to get too in the weeds with swing weight, but the long and short of it is basically swing weight is the perception of the weight of the head through your swing. So it's, it's you know, it, it's one of those things that certain people can play with clubs that I would think are too light and other people can play with clubs, you know, that are way too heavy. And for whatever reason, it works for them, even though on a swing weight scale it should suggest that this club is too heavy to use. It's all about individual preference. And Bob's point was more so about the length, I think. Um, you know, and I have a chart that I use to kind of give me an indication when I, when I measure a club, like for instance, this Niblick, it's 36 and a quarter inches, but the 46 degrees of loft suggest, according to my chart, that this club should actually be an inch longer than, actually an inch and a half longer than 36 and a quarter. It should actually be 37 and three quarters. And that's a measurement that I've come up with a lot of uh, observation, basically, uh, comparing clubs that have what I think is the ideal swing weight of D0, D1, comparing the loft and the length of those clubs to other clubs. And so I compare that to this and I say, all right, 46 degrees, this should be an in, you know, a 37 and three quarter inch club based on my observations with other clubs with ideal swing weight. And if I did the math, I would determine, you know, that adding an inch and a, uh, inch and a half of length to this club would bring this from C4 to about D0, D1. So, um, you know, the math kind of works out that way. I'm no mathematician by any means, but uh, those little individual things, I think, have been fairly consistent and by my observation. And uh, that's how I can tell usually that, you know, even when I, I find a club on eBay or I find a club in a shop that I know is shorter, um, you can kind of get a ballpark idea of what the swing weight would be if, it, if you know, you know the length and you know the loft. All right, so I rambled on long, long enough about that. By, by the way, if you have any questions about swing weight or anything like that, feel free to drop a comment below um, and ask it there. Uh, I, I should do a video on swing weight specifically at some point because a lot of the videos that I've done, especially in the workshop, have alluded to swing weight. And there are a lot of things that I've learned um, where you can modify the swing weight of a club uh, without just throwing lead tape on it. Um, that's the quickest way to adjust it if you want it to be heavier is just put lead tape on it. But I like to be able to see all the markings. So I've tried to educate myself about all the different ways that you can affect swing weight, either by lengthening a shaft or replacing a shaft with a lighter version of the same length. Um, just a whole bunch of stuff and I should do a video on that in the future but if you know let me know if you're more if you're interested in finding out more about that because I, I think it's fascinating and uh, it used to be gospel in my opinion like if I saw a club that was less than C7 I would say no there's no way that's gonna work for me because I would say that's too light uh, I've certainly come around on that and I have clubs in my set now that I'll play that are less than what I used to think was my ideal swing weight and it just underscores the fact that you got to go out and play these clubs to really know if they're going to work for you. You can't go by just what somebody tells you, including me. You can't just go by what you see on an eBay listing. Um, you know, eBay's tougher because you can't play the club before you buy it. Uh, when I sell clubs to folks, I like to try to give them an opportunity to use the clubs that they're buying from me by playing around with them when they buy them. But sometimes it's not always possible. So I try to give you as much information as I, as I know ahead of time to kind of give you an idea of what swing weight you might prefer. Um, again, I sidetracked myself. This is what COVID does to you. I, I you know, got hit by COVID two weeks ago, and there's certainly a brain fog that happens with it. I had a, a mild case, which I was fortunate you know, for, but um, yeah, it's kind of hard to keep your, your uh, mind on track. All right, well, I'll try to get myself back on track here and show you these other two clubs. Um, so we've got a standard Mills basic, you know, putter here that I've been playing around with while I've been rambling. Um, you know, that'll be a good, good club for a beginner. Um, let's see. 
Yeah, I'll show you that one in a second. This is a popular set with people. This is the George Nickel Indicator Series. The indicators were the first clubs to actually list what the yardage uh, range for the club is. And so that, you know, that's a collectible aspect to this club. Again, this is shorter than it should be. This is 30 degrees at 37 and a half inches. This should actually be um, a half inch longer, 38 inches, if it's 30 degrees, based on my observation. And uh, it's C1, even with the extra half inch, it's still going to be uh, mid-C's. So again, um, I've talked about this on the channel before too, that uh, late era hickory clubs like this one are often lighter than you would expect. Um, the makers, for whatever reason, were making clubs in the mid-C range for swing weights, and um, it, it, partly because I think what people expected. But um, uh, yeah, interesting little side note there. Um, the other club that was in here, the other hickory club that I wanted to show you, is a cool one as well. This is a Butchert Nichols, and uh, I mentioned the bamboo shaft on the Gibson Cosby Mashie. Um, this is also a bamboo shaft, and you can see the two areas where hickory has been introduced to it as well. So it's kind of tougher to see on the butt end, but you can see a perimeter of bamboo with a core of hickory. And then there's also some extra hickory that's been added to the uh, hosel area that would be under the whipping normally. Uh, but it's kind of help this, uh, the hosel of the head meet the shoulder of the shaft a little bit better. So yeah, cool, cool club here. It also has a very nice stamp uh, from the Butchert Nichols Company right in the bamboo right there. This is a 47 degree club. C1 um, probably would end up being in the mid to high C's after uh, correct length shaft. But in this instance, I'm not gonna do anything with this. I like the fact that it's bamboo. This will actually probably uh, end up for sale. Um, so keep an eye on this, potentially showing up on my website, uh, or if you're going to the Gulf Heritage Society National Convention in Indianapolis, which is coming up in, in uh, late September, I believe it's September 22, 23, 24, something like that, I'll be there. I'll have two tables set up, so I'd love to meet you there, and uh, you can see some of these things that I'm showing you in Fresh Finds. Okay, so anyway, to wrap up this find, we got the club here, we got the, the uh, early steel shaft, and then we've got five hickory clubs. All of that cost me a total of $27.12. I don't normally like to tell you what I pay for clubs because I find some pretty good deals that, um, you know, I'm trying to keep on the DL because, you know, I, I'm happy to share information with you, but I also want to keep my competition a little bit lower uh, for, for clubs. Um, but, you know, uh, that said, I'm happy to have more people out there playing hickory golf. So if you beat me to a deal, that's great. But anyway, I'll give you a tip on AuctionNinja.com because um, I, I think that's definitely kind of an un, uh, uncharted territory for hickory clubs. They don't pop up that often. I would say probably every month and a half I see a hickory golf club listing. But whenever they do show up, they're almost always uh, very rusty uh, condition. So use a little bit of imagination when you're looking at the photos, but I guarantee you're going to get them for a song. And 27 bucks for those clubs that I showed you in this bag, you're not going to beat that. And uh, yeah, I've been fortunate to find some other fun things at Long Island Estate Sales uh, over the last month. And when I do the quick tour of the workshop here in a second, I'll show you that. But before we get to that, I want to show you the other fresh find for this, this episode. So what I'm holding here is the latest addition to my pre-1850 feathery set. This is an early 1800 replica of a Simon Kosar Baffer. Uh, Elmer Nahum made this club for me, and I'm very excited to have uh, Elmer Nahum uh, original club, you know, a replica, uh, whatever you want to call it, in my collection now. Uh, because Elmer, in my opinion, is, is kind of the, the, the top tier of uh, expert club maker. He, he's the author of Practical Club Making. Uh, he's the person who inspired uh, my friend Brad Corando to start making um, long nose play clubs, you know, 19th century uh, replicas of long nose play clubs. And uh, just a master woodworker and very humble guy too, so he'd probably disagree with me calling him a master woodworker, but he, in my opinion, he really is. Um, you know, he makes these beautiful play clubs and uh, does meticulous research into the characteristics of these clubs. 
Um, and I think that's the key is that, you know, you could make what you think is a long nose play club. Um, but unless you're basing it on something that actually existed, it's kind of an anac anachronism. Um, and I really appreciate that Elmer does extensive research into the clubs that he makes uh, and into the clubs that he cho teaches you how to make through practical club making um, so that you know when you finally come up with the club that you're getting about as close as you can to what the original would have been like uh, short of actually playing with it or holding it in your hand. Um, so the backstory on this particular club is um, the Fresh Finds video that I posted um, a month ago featured a couple rut niblicks in it that I had recently picked up from Bill Wardwell up in Massachusetts. And one of those rut niblicks I was predating to uh, probably late 1890s uh, based on its, its characteristics, its weight, um, the, the, the crease in the hosel, some other indications that uh, it's probably a, a pre-1900 club. Uh, but I didn't have any other information about it. The, the markings on it were pretty faint, and I couldn't really tell who the maker was. Um, so after I posted that video, I'm not sure Elmer saw that video specifically or if it was just coincidence, but he reached out to me and asked if I had any small-headed niblicks or rut niblicks that he'd be able to add to his pre-1900 gutty set um, because he was planning on playing in the Foxburg um, gutty event that, that takes place in mid-August. So that just happened last uh, two weeks ago now, I think. Um, anyway, bottom line is he reached out to me and I said, I actually have this one small head niblick that I don't know who the maker is, but the weight is really good. The loft is good. And I think it would work for you. So I sent him some photos and he was interested in picking it up and he asked how much it was. Well, when I'm dealing with another collector or, you know, especially in Elmer's case, a club maker, I'm not really interested in, you know, just doing a, a transaction for money. I'd be mu I'm much more interested in trading. And so I said, do you have anything you'd be interested in trading? And uh, much to my surprise, he asked, do I need any additional clubs for my feathery set that Brad Carando made me? And uh, I, I said, as a matter of fact, I am interested in, in an extra club. The, the highest lofted club that I currently have, um, I believe is a 30 degree bathing spoon. Uh, Robert Forgan replica, and I've had a couple situations where it would have been helpful to have a little bit more loft. And so I mentioned that to uh, Elmer, and I also said, um, I'm aware of a club that existed back in the day called a wooden niblick. And uh, if you're familiar with a the niblick, then it's kind of self-explanatory. A wooden niblick was basically a high lofted, uh, shorter wooden club that you'd use to get yourself out of trouble. Uh, and I should also mention here at this point, that even though the feathery era was dominated by these kinds of long nose wooden clubs, they also had irons. You know, they would use uh, sand irons and, uh, you know, clubs to extract themselves from situations where they wouldn't want to mess up their wood club. Um, but that all said, I was still finding myself in situations where um, it would have been helpful to have a little bit more loft getting out of some rough, you know, things like that. So I mentioned the, the concept of a wooden niblick to Elmer and he said, he had come across a couple clubs. Actually, the way I asked him was, what's the highest lofted long nose club you've come across? And he mentioned a uh, Tom Morris, um, basically a baffing spoon um, from the, uh, the collection of the USGA that he had an opportunity to actually take some photos of and uh, handle and uh, took some dimensions. And he said that one was 34 degrees. And... Um, so I said, well, I would be interested in something like that because I think that would complement the clubs that I already have in, in my feathery set. And uh, also would give me an Elmer Nahum uh, club to add to my collection, which I would love to do. So um, I, I was totally prepared to pay him on top of the trade because what he ended up sending me is way more valuable, in my opinion, than the rut niblick I sent to him. But, um, you know, Elmer and I have had a, a nice rapport with one another through Instagram and, um, you know, I, I think he, uh, he appreciates that I appreciate what he does and um, was happy to kind of help me out here. So what he ended up coming up with is this club, not the Tom Morris uh, from the, uh, the USGA Museum, but instead a Simon Cosart. Uh, Cosart was one of the premier club makers in the early 1800s uh, based out of Edinburgh. And... Um, was one of the first club makers to actually mark his name on, on the head. 
uh, prior to that, you know, expert club makers would just make clubs anonymously, essentially. And so they'd get out, you know, in, into play and, and no one would know exactly who made those clubs, though I would suspect that certain club makers had kind of characteristics that if you were to set a bunch of them down, you'd be able to say, oh, yeah, this is this guy, this is this guy. Um, but you, you made it a lot easier when you started put your, putting your name on it. And interestingly, uh, Cosart put his name uh, parallel to the club face as opposed to perpendicular, which is the way that we're used to seeing it. So this club features a parallel name, but it's Enehem. And uh, this is important. I've mentioned this before on my channel, but I want to mention it again because I think it's important um, that if you're a club maker or you're somebody who's making replica clubs, it's important in some capacity to mark the club with your own name um, so that down the line, collectors don't get confused. Um, you know, I'm sure it still happens today that unmarked clubs that are actually replicas find their way into auctions where either the auctioneer doesn't know enough about the club and, and advertises it as an original or just communication mishaps. You know, all the information isn't included with the club. But you clear that up as the original club maker if you do something to it that signifies that it's your, your club that you've created and not whatever it is you're trying to represent. You know, the, the thing about Elmer is he's such a great club maker that if he wanted to, he could make a Cosart exactly like whatever the example is that he might be holding in his hand of an original. He could do the same thing with a Hugh Philp. Um, you know, replicas in the hands of somebody like Elmer Nahum could be very dangerous if he didn't put his name on them because, you know, from a craftsmanship perspective, uh, unless you really dove in and tried to, you know, date the materials and all that stuff, just based on looks, you would, you would think you're looking at the real deal. Um, so I, I really, you know, want to, like I said, underscore having, you know, a name on here. Elmer does it. Gavin Bottrell from uh, the UK does it as well. Um, he might put his name on the bottom and, and stamp the, the whatever the original club makers is name up here. But he does it somewhere on the club to signify that it's, it's, uh, it's a replica. I think Gavin actually uses his initials GB and then the number, you know, the serial number of the club. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's, it's a beautiful club and I can't wait to use it. Um, I believe it's 38 inches in length and a D4 or D5 swing weight, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, he also, um, he didn't put any kind of grooves on the face, so it's a smooth face and he actually took a little bit of the hook off of the uh, toe. This would have uh, uh, you know, normally been a little bit more curved, I believe, uh, but he asked me if I have a tendency to hit balls off the toe. And you know, of course, my name's Hickory Hacker, so <laughs> I don't get sweet spot contact all the time. And I said, yeah, that is my, my miss with these clubs is I end up having you know, ball marks that are up here on the toe. So he kind of helped me out a little bit up here and gave me a little bit more of a straighter face than I would have had if this was an original Cosart. Um, but this should be a beautiful club to play with and I can't wait to get it out on the golf course. And um, yeah, with that, I think that's gonna wrap up this um, fresh find segment. I don't have anything to show you uh, project-wise in the workshop today, but I thought I'd get behind the camera and just kind of give you a walk around the, uh, the space. And um, yeah. And we'll show you that, and um, yeah, let's let's just do that right now. All right, welcome back. We're in the workshop again. I'm gonna give you a quick tour. Thanks for sticking around this long in this video. Just want to show you around real quick how I set this space up. So, if you remember what my space was in the last workshop, I didn't have this much room. Um, this it's very nice being able to have this much space. <laughs> to be able to have two tables set up and then also have your clubs that um, you're working on. Right now, the clubs that are gonna be on display in the museum are still over here. I mean, this is these are my pre-1900 gutty clubs, my higher end things uh, right here. And eventually these will be out in the other uh, part of the basement when that's finished. But for now, they're in here. And I have realized that I, I like having them displayed 
like this, where they're kind of standing up, the weight's on the bottom, and the shaft is just allowed to lean. Um, I'm not sure there's any, uh, you know, ideal way to store clubs or, or display clubs. I like using the clipped um, pool cue holders that I have from Amazon that I, I showed you in the last uh, display space. But um, yeah, in lieu of those, when they're just kind of standing, I like using these stands better uh, than anything else. These are okay too. These are fishing rod holders to kind of show the clubs. Uh, but yeah, as far as storing them is concerned, um, I'm not sure there's an ideal way to do it. Uh, I just think it's probably better to avoid any situation where you're putting a lot of weight on the shafts. So that might mean, you know, I think I probably need to do these a little different here. Um, right now I think it's okay, but if I had a bunch of clubs in this kind of setup and they were all leaning on one another and all the weight of the heads was pushing on the interior clubs. I don't know, I think maybe in time that could end up helping warp a shaft, but honestly, I haven't had an issue with it. Uh, people have asked me in the past if this has been a problem for me by having the clubs uh, stored this way. These are all the clubs I use for beginner sets. Uh, and honestly, no, I haven't had any issue with them at all. I'm not sure if maybe it's just a matter of the temperature uh, or humidity situation, but um, yeah, this this flat plastic um, shelf has been great, and I've not had any issues storing my clubs that way. Uh, again, though, with clubs that I want to display, I think I probably would prefer to do it that way, um, or have them on the clips from Amazon. But even then, you know, when you've got a club hanging on the clip, if there are a lot of uh, temperature variations potentially in the area that you're hanging the club. Um, you know, you could start to see a club that's hanging that way uh, warp over time. But, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, most of my clubs are players. And if I have a sh an issue with with a, a warp shaft, that's been working really well for me. And I'm going to do another video on that in the near future because I've discovered a way that uh, has been really good at making sure you've got a nice straight shaft. It just takes a little bit more um more detail than I was doing before. All right, but anyway, let's get back to the tour here. So clubs that are going to be out in the uh, display, there's a quick glimpse of the rest of the basement. Um, I'm not going to show you any more of that because there's it's a mess. I uh, picked this up recently from a Facebook Marketplace listing on Long Island. That's an A.B. Frost picture that I, I quite like. Um, so I got my brassies here. I like these, these containers. Um, these are fiber fiberboard containers, uh, really rigid and great for moving things back and forth. Um, you know, if you're moving clubs in a move like I was recently from Connecticut to Long Island. Um, these are clubs I'm going to be taking with me to the GHS National in Indianapolis uh, late September. So I won't show you what those are quite yet, but I've got here's a sneak peek of some others that are going to be ready to go for that event. Nice set of Stewarts here that I'm excited to bring. Um, I've been building that set for a while and finally have it to a point where I can probably put it together and, and uh, sell it. Um, these are some nicer bags that I've collected over the years. Those are all fully functional, by the way, too. The straps are good, so that's why they're hanging there. And these are clubs that need to be worked on. I've got some semi-transitional uh, turn-of-the-century uh, gutty woods down there that uh, I'm going to do a video on in the near future as well. Probably the next issue or next um, episode of Fresh Finds. All right, so then scanning over here, like I said earlier, really nice to have extra space to be able to set up two workbenches so I can kind of lay things off when I'm working on them and also have two different spots for shooting video. Um, this is obviously where I'll do some heavier duty kind of projects where the sturdier table comes in handy and uh, the vise works well there. Um, this I picked up off of, uh, from Harbor Freight. Ideally, it would be great to have a vintage machine tool, sh uh, box like, you know, that, but, um, until I find one that's affordable, this will do. And it worked great for the move. So this is where I'm keeping all my stuff and I'm keeping myself, excuse me, way more organized now, um, in this new space, uh, just partly because I want to keep things tidier, but also because I've realized that filming um, you know, you really do need to have dedicated space to filming and you need to keep it clean and clear so that you're not constantly putting things away, 
uh, when you want to get down to filming. So things are way more organized now in this space. I've got all my grips, the pre-cut pre grips that I make from my sides of Tandy leather down here. I've got the most used uh, uh, materials there, for, like shaft conditioning, rust removal, abrasives, and then that box is uh, epoxy and uh, other adhesives. All the books that I use on a regular basis um, right there. I got a laptop here that I use. I actually have a Google Doc spreadsheet that I use to keep track of all the clubs in my collection for when I'm building sets and uh, I find it very useful. So if you're interested in figuring out a way to keep track of your inventory, reach out and I'll share how I do that. There are all my good shafts for replacement. I've got all my vintage underlisting here on display. I'll use those eventually, but uh, they display pretty cool as well. And then more organization down here. I keep everything that I come across, including the grips from old clubs. There's a guy at the GHS National last year that bought a bunch of these vintage grips for me in bulk. So I'll be bringing a bunch of these with me to Indianapolis. And uh, yeah, just save it all. You never know who might need it. And um, I think the guy that bought the grips from me probably just puts them on wall hangers that he then sells to people. But uh, yeah. There's always, um, you know, just save everything from these clubs. Just, just organize it. Keep, keep track of it. Okay, and then uh, just stepping away. That'll be my ball making station in the off season. I've got some balls ready to work on down there, and I think that about does it. So, this is where the magic's going to happen. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be uh, working on some projects here pretty soon that I'll film for a future episode of Workshop, or actually uh, Fix It Friday, and then Workshop Wednesday in the off season. Um, but uh, yeah, with that, I think we'll sign off this week. Thanks for watching, folks.